Marcelin Boulle's 1920 reconstruction of the La Chapelle Neanderthal with a forward projecting cranium was based on the position of the foramen magnum, which is further back in the skull than in modern humans. The foramen magnum is a large hole in the underside of the skull that connects the brain cavity to the spinal canal. With such a massively extended skull, Neanderthals would have had an exceptionally strong neck to support their heavy skull and massive brain. In modern humans, this hole is in the middle of the skull. In Neanderthals, it is located further back due to the elongated shape of their skull. The Neanderthal foramen magnum shape distinguishes it from other hominids. The foramen magnum in Neanderthal is oval-shaped, as opposed to the more round shape found in other modern humans, an important fact we will revisit later in the video. Meanwhile, the question of whether or not Neanderthals buried their dead has been continually debated since the discovery of the La Chapelle Neanderthal in 1908. Excavations in the La Ferrissi rock shelter in 1909 revealed the bones of an adult male and an adult female, providing scientists with the first evidence of sexual dimorphism in Neanderthals. A total of eight Neanderthal individuals, including adults, toddlers, infants and two fetuses, were discovered buried in La Ferrassi, in what can only be described as a Neanderthal cemetery. The La Ferrassi man is regarded by many scientists as the classic example of Neanderthal anatomy. His leg and foot bones unequivocally demonstrated that Neanderthals walked upright and with a stride akin to modern people. This contradicted a previous reconstruction of the La Chapelle au Saint Neanderthal skeleton by a French artist, which depicted this species as stooping, brutish beings. The Neanderthal of La Chapelle au Saint was buried in a pit created by other members of its group and shielded from disturbance by rock and soil. These findings confirm the presence of West European Neanderthal burial rituals and a high level of cognitive capacity. The well-preserved La Chapelle skull has the low receding forehead, prominent mid-face, oval-shaped foramen magnum, and thick brow ridges that are characteristic of Homo neanderthalensis. Scientists believe the old man was fairly old when he died, as bone had regrown along the gums where he had lost many teeth, maybe decades before. But not all Neanderthal bones show visible trauma, and the overall frequency of apparent injuries is comparable to those reported in hunter-gatherers living in similar harsh conditions today. Indeed, any claim that Neanderthal had a poor life expectancy is difficult to support when compared to other hunter-gatherer groups, despite physically demanding lives spent stabbing woolly mammoths and straight-tusk elephants, and life-and-death battles with Stone Age hyenas, lions and bears. Another La Ferrassi skeleton, a three- to five-year-old child, had three flint tools, a point and two very large side scrapers, carefully placed on top of his body, which had been interred in a deep pit covered by a limestone slab whose inferior face was decorated with cupules. These cupules are artificially made depressions on the rock surface, and some investigators have interpreted this rock to be a map of the region meant to guide the dead person, with the cupules representing local caves. What's more, the Laferassi one skeleton, an adult male, was buried in a shallow pit, together with a cylindrical bone fragment decorated with four sets of parallel incisions. Nonetheless, until recently, the lives of Neanderthal children remained unclear. Now, a revolution in archaeology over the last two or three decades has begun to reveal personal details about even the smallest of them. Despite the more delicate bones, Researchers have a considerable amount of Neanderthal children's remains to investigate. Children's fossilized bones are among the growing collection of Neanderthal remains that have been unearthed. Archaeologists are now receiving unprecedented insights about Neanderthals thanks to modern scientific tools. One of the most significant breakthroughs in thinking concerns the children of these close relatives of our own species. By examining their skeletons, researchers appeared that Neanderthals' growth was very similar to that of our own babies from the moment they were born. But anatomical elements only apparent under extreme magnification have revealed more subtle variances. While covered in a downy fluff like are our newborns, the Neanderthal's head would already seem longer. You couldn't tickle them under the chin as easily because they lacked the bony projecting chin of modern humans. 
Surprisingly, the modeling of skull form reveals that even if Neanderthal skulls grew slightly faster and were differently shaped, their brains did not grow differently, implying that their children most likely reached the magical milestones of smiling, crawling and walking at identical ages. In fact, if Neanderthal and modern-day children met, they could play and laugh together. Nonetheless, the Devil's Tower boy, discovered in Gibraltar in 1926, died at the age of about five, possibly from skull fractures. Moreover, he had already experienced a catastrophic incident as a toddler. His jaw was fractured. It is unclear to explain how these injuries occurred, but Neanderthal childhood was definitely risky. Dorothy Garrard excavated the remnants from a Musterian shelter on the Devil's Tower site. There is evidence of a mouth injury, and the teeth exhibit developmental problems consistent with seasonal malnutrition. The typical Neanderthal brain case is obvious, and brow ridges had begun to form in the child. The skull provided significant support for the Gibraltar Neanderthal's evidence. The frontal bone, most of the right side of the face, and the left parietal bone all survived, as did the majority of the lower jaw. Furthermore, scientists who investigated the skeleton of a Neanderthal baby recovered in a cave in the northern Levant believe it was purposefully buried. The ten-month-old Neanderthal newborn was placed to rest on its right side in a small nook near the cave's north wall. The skull has been crushed and the face is severely damaged, but much of the rest of the bones has survived 50,000 to 60,000 years of burial. The jawbone of a red deer was lying on the pelvis, indicating that it was a ritual offering. Three leg bones from another baby, possibly aged six to nine months, were also discovered nearby. The baby's bones were discovered still articulated, indicating that the baby had not been injured at the time of death. The skeleton of the infant from the Amud cave shows a number of anatomical features that help to establish its taxonomic status as Homo neanderthalensis, including the oval shape of the foramen magnum and the lack of a bony chin. These features, which appear on a ten-month-old baby, must be attributed to genetic origins. As such, they demonstrate the degree of phylogenetic separation of Neanderthals from modern and Stone Age Homo sapiens. What is becoming obvious is that Neanderthals visited this cave at least three times, slept on the sediments nearby, and buried a body. Although it is difficult to deduce traditions from archaeology, this appears to be a tradition of disposing of the deceased in a very similar manner, and it is clearly done with care, as two of the remains are fairly complete. Although the skull has been crushed and the face has been seriously disfigured, the majority of the bones have survived 50,000 to 60,000 years of burial. The discovery of bones at Amud Cave adds to our understanding of Neanderthal culture and intelligence. Several alleged Neanderthal burials have been proven false in recent years, but the Amud burial may be less problematic. When taken together, the data indicate that traditions were passed down through generations and that Neanderthals may have lived in a society where stories and symbolic ideas influenced their actions. In other aspects, they were human beings like us, and they undoubtedly buried some of their deceased at times. If that is the case, even if the items were not a funerary gift or memorial as we might imagine, they would still be highly significant in behavioural terms, as there are very few well-supported cases of objects or materials intentionally left with Neanderthal skeletons one being the jaw of a red deer with the Neanderthal child from the Amud site. Lastly, the Kafze human fossils were discovered in the Levant's Kafze cave. The remains show a combination of characteristics found in archaic and anatomically modern humans. They have been provisionally dated to between 80,000 and 120,000 years old, using electron paramagnetic resonance and thermoluminescence dating techniques. The brain structure is identical to modern humans, and the foramen magnum is in the centre of the skull, but they have brow ridges and a projecting facial profile like Neanderthals. They were once thought to be a transitional species between Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans, or hybrids of the two species. Not far from the Amud cave, the bones of fifteen archaic humans, including eight children, were discovered in Kafsi, inside a Mysterian archaeological setting, and dated to around 95,000 years old. The remains of six individuals were deliberate burials, making them the earliest ever uncovered.
Kafsa 11 was the body of a 13-year-old adolescent discovered in a pit excavated into the bedrock. The skeleton was laying on its back, legs twisted to the side, and both hands on either side of the neck, holding the antlers of a huge red deer gripped to the chest. Kafsa 12 is a youngster around three years old, with skeletal anomalies indicating hydrocephalus, a neurological disorder caused by an abnormal buildup of spinal fluid deep within the brain, potentially due to a defect caused by interbreeding with Neanderthals. And with that tantalizing statement, we will leave you to ponder the mysteries of our shared human history. Until next time, stay curious and stay questioning. Please subscribe, share, and check out our channel's other videos. Take care.